Kính. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for the AGX organizers, Charlotte and Co, for inviting me. And thanks all of you guys for uh, for being here and thinking seriously about this question of how you can do the most good. That's fantastic. So I'm going to skip that one because I just had a fantastic clear intro to who I am. So I'm going to launch straight in. Right. Here is some top secret behind the scenes data from Animal Advocacy Career's Google Analytics account. Um, and this data worries me a bit. What is it about it that worries me? I can see you're staring intently. This is a good start. It's had the intended effect. Uh, what about it worries me? Well, several different things. But the one I want to draw attention to is this. <clears throat> the number of page views for the tab labeled job board is roughly 10 times the number of page views for the tab labeled careers advice. And why is this happening? Well, there are probably a number of reasons that seem quite rational from the perspective of a job seeker or somebody thinking about what careers they want to go into. Uh, for instance, maybe you only need to read some of the careers advice content once or twice, uh, but you need to like, keep regularly checking a job board or something like that. But I think something else might be going on too. I'm worried that people who want to help animals just don't really have one of these, uh, a career planning process and that they launch straight in at the deep end of just thinking like which jobs they want to go into without, or, or just like concretely looking at those jobs without doing much of the thinking part first. Uh, and really kind of exploring those different options and trying to work out, get a better sense of which will enable them to have the most impact uh, or where they could, where could be the best fit for them personally. And this seems like a bad idea for me, to me for common sense reasons. Would you buy a house without visiting it first or well, probably not? Would you like, you probably would do other tests of your suitability for home ownership as well or like in that location, like maybe you'd, you'd visit the area, maybe you'd rent a house in that area before you bought one. Uh, and so you'd, you'd be trying to work out various things about whether it was a good fit for you, whether it was the right decision. And so when we make important life decisions, we tend to tread cautiously doing like increasing tests of how well suited that thing is for you. And the same is, or at least should be, I think, true with career shifts. And once you start to think about careers in terms of helping animals as much as you can, uh, then I think there are like quite a few different complex considerations that we have to take, take seriously, and that it's essentially even more important to start doing these tests and building up an understanding of which is the best option for you and for animals. So in this session, I'm gonna talk through some things Oops. Yeah, some things uh, that you can do to concretely like test your fit with different career options and think about next steps and what you should actually be doing. I don't think this like short talk is going to provide you with all the answers. Like you're not going to walk away with this with a, a finalized career plan and, and knowing what you should do to, to help animals as much as possible. Um, so the goal is very much to like present a few things that you could potentially do afterwards and like some resources that you could look into rather than like, yeah, that completed career plan. And I'm not gonna discuss in detail any of the underlying ideas about career strategy itself, by which I mean the sort of basic factors that you should consider in order to have a high impact career. We do summarize those in a page on our website called the Glossary of Terms and explore those in various resources throughout the website. Um, I'm also not going to try and make the case for animal advocacy as a high priority cause area in any detail, but just to summarize that case kind of briefly, um, the problem is very large in scale in the present day with tens or perhaps hundreds of billions of animals confined in factory farm conditions at any one point. And internationally, nonprofit work to challenge factory farming um, only receives about $200 million per year. So I think it's somewhat neglected. And numerous successes in recent years... Yeah, numerous success in recent years with animal welfare reforms and animal product alternatives suggest that progress of various types is tractable. And I also think there are pathways through which animal advocacy can reduce the risks of astronomical suffering in the long-term future through a broader process of moral circle expansion. And I believe that this should be a, like, a non-negligible proportion of the uh, portfolio of spending an effort for long-termists, not just people concerned to have an impact on the present day. And 
obviously this a kind of complicated argument that I don't have time to like go through in this talk. That's not the focus of the talk. But if you're interested in that aspect, you can find further information about that on the website of Census Institute, the organization I used to work at, or just on my EA forum profile if you find that. Okay, so let's move past that and say you're convinced and you want to have, uh, sorry, at least explore career paths that would enable you to have high impact for animals. Um, the next thing you need to do is come up with a list of options that you want to explore further and look into. And again, in this talk, I'm not going to have time to run through all the various types of options that you can consider because there's so many different things and it's, you know, there's not like one generic list. There's so many kind of tailored or specific options you could think about and, and come up with. But this is just, just to quickly go through that, uh, this is like a helpful, well, I think it's helpful, <laughs> categorization of some different role types. So we've got food companies, government and policy, advocacy, research, donations, direct care. And within most of these different areas, you could potentially work in nonprofits, external institutions that aren't like, I don't identify as part of the movement or, or some such, like companies, governments, universities, or quite often you could work fairly independently. And then of course, yeah, if you look at the options a bit more granularly, there's like a whole range of different categories within each of those different things. So for example, effective animal advocacy nonprofits and animal product alternatives companies both include roles in like marketing, roles in operations, roles in research, and those will look different to each other. They look different in the nonprofit versus the animal product alternatives companies context. So there's just a whole range of different things. And again, some of the resources, some of the resources on our website um, would help you explore that. We've got like a bunch of resources on our blog, uh, our online course and so on that could help you think through the, some of the different sorts of options that are out there. But suppose you've already got a list of options. <laughs> Apologies if you don't. <laughs> you can leave if you want. Um, suppose you've already got a li lo list of options that you want to explore. I think the ladder of tests is a helpful framework uh, and it's one that I'm going to use to structure essentially the rest of this talk. And the basic idea of the ladder of tests is that you start with a wide range of options and you do increasingly in-depth research on each of them. So you start with something quite quick and easy, like some online research. And if you're happy with your exploration at that stage, then you climb up to the next rung of the ladder uh, and keep exploring that role type or career path. But the idea is also that after doing some research into a particular career path, if you go off that idea, then you rule that option out and you don't keep climbing up the ladder for that because there's no point because you're not going to focus on it. So while you might explore lots of options in a short and shallow way near the bottom of the ladder, you won't climb as far up the ladder for some options as for the other ones that you explore and remain confident and excited about. So I, I say confidence, that was probably the wrong word, because the aim isn't really confidence. It, the aim is that, because you're always going to be uncertain about what is best, all things considered. The aim is instead to find the best initial ranking and then go from there to do like low cost tests and basic research to enable you to like, essentially keep going with whatever your best guess is um, or exploring where you think you've got most information value and so on. So yeah, once you've done some of that initial research, the best, the most efficient way to learn is probably to basically pick an option and try it out. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but yeah, I should also say if you're more time constrained, maybe this whole process will take longer and that's absolutely fine because I think it's worth investing the time. Uh, in trying to work out which career is best for you and which career will enable you to have the most impact. And of course, for some people, it might mean that you spend slightly less time on each rung of the ladder because you, you just have to for various reasons. Uh, and that's fine. I'm also going to suggest some kind of rough timeframes with each rung of the ladder through the rest of this, but they're very rough and like, don't look at them and be like, oh, I haven't spent 15 hours on this rung yet. Um, it's just chucking out like a ballpark to give you some ideas. And obviously it depends a lot on the individuals what's best. So let's start with the first rung of the ladder uh, with online research and some examples of what you can do here. So my top recommendation for this kind of online research element is the skills profiles on Animal Advocacy Careers website, which are essentially reports on specific promising role or career types. And they're pretty close to an all-in-one answer for your kind of initial rung of the ladder doing some online research to work out if that seems like it could potentially be something for you. And here are a couple of screenshots from pages from one of our skills profiles, um, for example, of what you're getting, basically. And each skills profile contains information about how does this work out for animals? Who is this work a good fit for? How much do we need more expertise in this area? What options would you have if you were to leave this path? And how to prepare for roles of that type? 
And these skills profiles are usually based on a combination of my own desk-based research plus interviews with between five and 15 people working in the area. So the idea is that if you read through that, then it should be a pretty great starting point and setting you up with a solid kind of basic understanding of the key information, specifically with a focus on helping animals. Obviously, I think these skills profiles are pretty good because I wrote them. Uh, but unfortunately, we're a relatively small organization, so we don't have everything. We've only got five of them, and which only covers like a pretty small proportion of the total different role types that you could explore that could help animals. So I'd, recommend, I'd also recommend 80,000 hours excellent career profiles. These tend to be less focused specifically on careers that enable you to help animals, but a lot of them are cross applicable across a, a range of different cause areas. Uh, and especially good for things like uh, there are some options on there like becoming a public intellectual or a journalist or things like that that could apply um, and various ones specific to like building up career capital or enabling you to earn high amounts of money that you could then donate to nonprofits and things like that. So there's some great stuff there. Um, but even then, animal advocacy careers and ATK have not managed to cover all the possible options, uh, especially if you have like a, a fairly niche skill set or exploring something fairly unique then you may need to do some independent online research even to get those basics, and we, we just might not have that. Uh, I found in my research for the skills profiles that we've got there that uh, coming, using concrete phrases like day in the life of and things like that can, can help you get to the sorts of information that can be pretty helpful. And more generally, you can use like Boolean search terms and specific phrases to like sift through the random stuff that SEO marketing people will like throw your way. Okay. Um, so you've like, yeah. Uh, so once you've got your head around some of the basics, it can be useful to ask someone who works in the area about some of your initial questions uh, and to get some more up-to-date information and that sort of thing. And they may, yeah, they may be able to give you information that is like not covered on those on those kind of skills profiles or online. And I think there can be risks in reaching out to people about this sort of thing in the sense that they're basically informally interviewing you. Like if you ask them some really dumb questions, maybe they're like, what is this person about? Um, and th obviously there's costs to your time and to their time. Uh, but that said, I think a lot of people are just overly hesitant to reaching out to people and asking them questions. And you should like think <laughs> about roughly where you're on that spectrum if you're just like overly keen to reach out to people prematurely or the opposite. Um, and if, you, if basically if you've already done some basic research, I think you probably won't come across in that in that dumb way that some people worry they might do. So yeah, you remember as well that the community, both the animatic community and effective altruism community are filled with people who genuinely want to help and do good. So they tend to be nice and they tend to be willing to, to help if they can. Cool. Um, so yeah, with, with regards to who you should speak to, there's obviously various options for what sorts of people you can ask. You can ask friends who happen to do relevant work. You can ask indirect connections, like maybe friends of friends. Uh, or you can ask people who work in the area who have expressed interest in speaking to people with careers questions in some way or another. Um, and of course, there's also the option of people working in the area who you have no reason, particular reason to think are keen to have this kind of conversation. So with regards to specifics, like you're here, it's a great opportunity, don't waste this. Have a look on the Swap Card app and see if there's anyone with experience in particular areas that you are considering, and that might be in another cause area, just kind of comparable or something, or it could be specifically working to help animals, uh, and see if you can arrange a meeting with them before the end of the conference. Uh, yeah, so I think that's helpful if you've had some time to read some of the basic information, but I think at a conference like this, the expectation is a little bit more open, so I think you can be feel pretty free to just reach out to people. My other top recommendation for useful conversations like this is the Effective Animal Advocacy Community Directory, where people have listed their areas of, of interest and expertise. And you can see the URL here on the screen. Sorry, I'm going to leave it up on the screen for about 30 seconds or so. Uh, so I would encourage you to literally put that into your phone if that sounds useful and do it now. Um, and sign up as well. Put yourself in there in case someone reaches out to you about something helpful. But yeah, it has a column on there where people have noted if they're happy for you to reach out to them about careers specifically um, and, and other things as well. But yeah, if you're, uh, if you're interested in work that, help, work that focuses on animal product alternatives, I'd also check out there the Good Food Institute's website have like lots of different directories in, on it hidden in various parts of the website. Like they have one for people in research labs. They have one that's much more general, like um, you, it's kind of like a talent database. Like you just say where you're interested in and companies can look through it when they're making hiring decisions and so forth. So yeah, if you're interested in animal product alternatives, really have a dig around their website as well as ours. Okay, um, so once you've read through some of the basics 
and spoken to someone with a more up-to-date impression, unless you're feeling like really confident that this is an area that will be one of your top two or three areas, uh, kind of like career paths going forwards, you might want to do a bit of deeper research. And to be honest, you probably do this in any case. Um, I don't think I've got anything particularly insightful to say here about what that might look like. It's essentially more reading and more talking. Uh, but if you've, you probably have some ideas already from what the research you've done about what would be helpful to look into. But here are some specific suggestions, articles, web pages, books, book summaries, books, podcasts, online courses, academic articles, recommendations, uh, and yeah, just more interviews and talking to people basically. So um, I mentioned at the start that some people seem to dive straight into job hunts without doing much thinking or considering a planning of their options, that sort of thing. But some people do have the essentially the opposite problem, I think, of where it can be tempting to get stuck into this like analysis mode indefinitely and just look, looking at the things and not actually taking the next step, next step. So you shouldn't spend too long on that desk research process. You need to, you could do some kind of time capping if you want, um, or just like make sure you're checking in. Like, have I got enough information to actually do the, the slightly more concrete test? So at, point, at some point, you basically need to get your hands dirty and actually give the thing a go. So one option for giving the thing a go is to basically just apply for jobs of that type. So 80,000 hours who have done a lot more one-to-one -one careers advising than I have, uh, note that one of the most useful but often neglected steps is simply to apply for lots of jobs. 80,000 hours often find people wondering whether one path is better than another when if they'd actually just applied for those role types, it would have been more obvious which one to go for. So of course, it's good to avoid wasting people's time, but you can apply for roles and like you're not obliged to accept the role if it gets offered to you. So you can apply for different role types and kind of see how that process goes, what you learn from it, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, you can, even if it's not explicit feedback that you get in interviews, you might be able to infer things from how far through the process you get uh, and just like how you feel during the process and kind of reflecting on, on what went well or kind of how difficult different sorts of things felt, that sort of thing. So you have, if you haven't seen it already, I strongly recommend having a look through Animavity Career's job board, uh, which obviously you can use for this purpose. Uh, this is currently focused on effective animal advocacy nonprofit roles. So you have to look beyond our job board if you're looking for other role types. But it does have like, there's a notes section underneath that has some suggestions for some other places that could be starting points. But yeah, I don't have all the answers on there if you want to look at other role types, basically. Um, yeah. So another option of this slightly more concrete engaged project that might take, you know, a few weeks worth of work basically is to do skilled volunteering. And the idea here is that if you already have expertise or skills, even if not like experience per se in a particular type of task or role, then you can offer this for free to a high impact nonprofit that could benefit from it. And apart from just benefiting the nonprofit themselves, this enables you to test your personal fit with that type of role in the effective animal advocacy nonprofit context. Um, so it, yeah, it probably won't work if you're like really early stage and don't really know what you've got to offer, uh, but it's a great option for some people. So this is the skilled volunteering board on our website. And let's say for, as an example, you've been running social media for a student society or something like that. And you've been reading up a bit about careers in digital marketing. So you've already got some kind of ideas about what works well. And then you can like go on our website on the skilled volunteering board and there's a section for marketing and communications. And then if you click on that, lo and behold, there's also a section for um, social media management and like a bunch of charities who have said, yeah, we'd love a skilled volunteer who can help us with social media management, including some amazing charities who've marked this as like especially high priority for them. So yeah, needless to say, there are like lots of other things that you could do in this kind of like slightly more concrete project phase uh, that I haven't covered. And these will depend on your personal circumstances and the role types you're considering and so on. Uh, here's another uh, screenshot of one of our skills, sorry, skills profiles. Um, but one category that comes up quite a lot is like independent, independent projects and work. Uh, for example, if you want to try research, have you tried doing some independent research and posting it on the Effective Altruism Forum? Uh, if you want to do lobbying, have you tried meeting your local representative and speaking to them about issues. <laughs> um, and yeah, somewhere between the skilled volunteering and independent projects idea is you could write more of these for me. Um, yeah, like I said, there's only five and we don't have time to do all of them. Obviously before launching into this, reach out to me and ask me and share your idea with me. But generally, um, yeah, if you're doing this process as I'm roughly recommending, you could probably write it up in something that looks like a skills profile anyway. 
Uh, and so like you're not adding that much time and then maybe also you get some cool credibility and Jamie says, well done. Nice, okay, so if you've done all those steps and you're still feeling optimistic about the career path that you're exploring, then essentially the, like the next step and kind of last step apart from longer term commitment uh, is yeah, a, is a kind of medium term commitment, two to 24 months, something like that. Uh, and I've already mentioned AAC's job board a few times and the, the ver there are kind of various ways you can find other jobs uh, that aren't covered on the job board. But I'd also like to briefly highlight a new opportunity that is essentially being created with the purpose of this talk in mind of helping people to explore careers that help animals. And that is AAC's new global fundraising work placement program. And we have partnered with some of the most effective animal advocacy nonprofits to help solve two of their biggest challenges simultaneously. One is getting enough money, and the second one is getting enough talented people who can help them with that particular bottleneck. Um, this is They report to us that they especially struggle to hire fundraisers. So of course, you should only really apply for this if you're like seriously considering fundraising roles, but if that's an option that you're, that you're considering and have climbed up the ladder of tests up to this kind of longer term commitment stage, then you'll get paid a competitive salary to work in an effective animal advocacy nonprofit doing important work for them. And the application deadline is the 1st of May. So if this is something that you think might be a good option for you, then yeah, please do uh, apply. But if you're not at that stage yet, and like you think maybe this is something I should apply for, consider this an incentive to get climbing up the, the ladder of tests uh, in time for that deadline. Cool, uh, I think that's it from me. But yeah, thanks very much for your interest in thinking about how you can do the most good and actually taking action on those steps. And I think we're pretty short of time for questions, but maybe we'll have some. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jamie. We do have a couple of questions uh, that I'd like to put to you briefly if you relate to have a quick go at them. Um, so the first question is from Samad, who's asking what non-research internship opportunities do you think are especially effective for students, which I think you kind of... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, yeah, non-research internship opportunities. Do I have anything interesting to say there? Don't think so. Like, yeah, we do list internships on our job board, so there'll be some things on there. Um, I think maybe one thing is somewhere between skill volunteering and internships is just like reach out to organizations if you think you've got something to offer like organizations don't necessarily list everything that they think could be good especially i this is a bit of a guess but i would hypothesize especially smaller and newer organizations like if you reached out to animal advocacy careers and said to us like huh looks like your website is missing this thing and i'm a web developer and i'll do it for you for free i'd be like nice off you go um, whereas I don't know if Mercy for Animals would say the same because they might be like, oh, we've got a web development team and you need to speak to them. So yeah, reach out to people and offer things, like suggest things. If you're like seem incompetent and like you can do it for them already, uh, you might even be able to get paid for it and negotiate it. So that's a uh, potential. Um, yeah, don't think I've got anything particularly insightful to add beyond that. That's, I think that's very helpful. Um, we've got two more questions. We've got about two minutes, so um, feel free to roll them down if you have a quick take on them. First one is from Martin, who's asking, what's your current take on careers in animal advocacy versus careers in um, economic protein, and what will help most clients, basically? Um, both good. <laughs> no, uh, I think it's a complex strategic question about whether we should prioritize like animal product alternatives or the more kind of like social advocacy. I think there's like a somewhat separate, but obviously intersecting question of like, do we do social advocacy for the tech or do we just increase the tech um with the latter question there's like a summary of arguments for and against that on sentience institute's website on the page foundational question summaries uh which is phrased as social versus tech um and i think yeah sorry i'm slightly forgetting the question which which seems more important um yeah i think i think basically we need investment in both strategies <laughs> uh, and i think there's re scope for reasonable disagreement about which is more to, which is more important to focus on if i could shift the allocation of resources from what it currently is, I would probably shift it slightly more towards the social side of tech, um, by which I mean like marketing around it and lobbying, as opposed to like individual diet change. But that's kind of tentative, and I think there's like confusing overlapping things here, so I don't have time to like <laughs> answer that in a very helpful way, I don't think. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, Nina's asking, how would you recommend figuring out what skills you have to offer for skilled volunteering? Yeah, um, I think 
Yeah, that's a good question. If you don't already have some intuitions about things that you could offer, then maybe it's not you're not ready for that. Uh, I think so. Eight thousand hours have a great resource on like finding your strengths. So I would recommend. I can't remember exactly what it's called. I'm pretty sure it says the word strengths in the title. So if you Googled eight thousand hours and strengths, it would probably give you that resource. I think it's got a bunch of helpful tests that you could do to think about it. Um, yeah, I think the skilled volunteering thing is more like I've got a thing I can offer you, and here it is. Uh, but you could potentially find that through just looking through their website and coming up with ideas. But yeah, I think that d depending where you're at in that process, like the strengths resource remains K might be the best thing at that stage. Thank you very much. It's 11 for tonight. Have a great time. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.